do you have character? Or are you a character? <laughs> are you a character study? Or are you studying to have character? <laughs> Maybe you're like me and you're a little of both. Sometimes. It's hard to tell the difference with some people, whether they're a character or a study in character, or have character, or whether they're studying to be a character, or whether they're just practicing character flaws. You see, character is that type of essence that makes up our personality, which we are trained to become who we are. Just as easy as the Bible says to train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they are old they will not depart. What happens to a child in growing up helps to lay a foundation for what will occur in their adulthood or as they mature through life and grow and become more of a person. The same thing is true in Christianity. You see, when you become born again, you start the life over again. Let me say that again, again and again. When you become born again, now think about it. Born again of the Spirit means you're born again. You're starting over. Now, you're starting over in a way you don't understand because, you see, having said you're born again doesn't mean that you don't already have preconceived ideas, intentions, comprehensions, and your own way of thinking. But being born again, depending on how old you were when you got saved, means you have to learn something new. It's different. It's not the same. They are two different entities completely. So a lot of miscomprehension happens in being born again because you're taking things from what you were into what you are. You see how that works? What you were was, yeah, you grew up with whatever you got, you know, from whatever you grew up with, you know. I mean, if you were raised prejudiced, you probably got some prejudice baggage hanging around, you know, and you're probably, you know, thinking different things about, you know, kind of some weird ideas of bias and prejudice and perspectives and, you know, bad information that you got because no one is born prejudiced. Same thing is true about sexual orientations that they're trying to make up these weird ideas about somehow it's a genetic marker or something. It's like, no, it's not. You don't have to be trained that way. You have to grow up that way. Sorry, it's the way it is. Because I'm effeminate, but I am not gay. <laughs> I have, and I'm sensitized to my emotional being, which isn't feminine or masculine, it's emotional. You know, and I'm very well aware of my emotions and very acclimated to them. But because I was raised in a matriarchal dominant way, I'm very aware of women's capabilities as well as women's fallibilities as well as men's capabilities and fallibilities. Because if you ever get into a matriarchal society, believe me, you're going to find out that, you know what, they're not butch but they are very well aware of what's going on. So, my point being is simply that knowledge given to you and growing up in that knowledge causes you to be a character or develop character capabilities or character flaws. Being born again, in our foundational way, we, when we first get saved, need to learn a strong foundation. We need to be discipled. We need to grow as children of God. We need to become aware of what the Bible says as opposed to what man says. Because when we're growing up, we kind of fake it. You know, there's no there's no real book. I mean, there is the Bible, but you know, most people aren't raised with the Bible as a textbook for how to live your life. Too bad. You know, it would have been good. There's no adult maturation book that says, hey, this is how you be mature. This is how you grow. You know, when you're two-year-olds, you'll be like this. When you're three-year-olds, there are some that are like passages by Gail Sheehy and different types of process, you know, evaluations of social ways that people have grown and developed, you know, like a, maybe a Spock for adults, you know, but there's no real set textbook because a lot of people figure it out for themselves, do for themselves. It's kind of like you watch parents become parents by having children, not because they were grown up as parents. You're not trained as a parent. It's kind of like a trial and error thing, you know, and for the most part, that's the way most parents are developed, trial and error. And so 
life is a great school if we treat it as such and we grow up into it. But there is a better way. And that's what God has to say. He says, look, you can have life the way you want it and do what you're doing according to the way you're doing it. You know, and you'll probably grow up to be a character of some type. You will be you, whoever you are and whatever you are. But you see, I have a character study that I want you to go by. I want you to see all these characters I have in the scriptures. I have lots of varieties of characters and all their fallibilities, their failings, as well as their character. I pretty much reveal to you what they're like, and kind of like in types and similes and metaphors, you could be like them and go through the same failings or successes that they did. But you see, we've been given something better than that, too. We've been given an example of what we should be and could be in Jesus. Of course, then again, it depends. Are you a character or are you developing character? I know myself. I'm both a character and have character. You know, in some ways, I'm a character. I enjoy it. I like it. I kind of like being me, you know. I did it my way, you know. I sing these songs, you know, and enjoy them. And I'm kind of like goofy in a lot of ways. Me? Who? Goofy? <laughs> I don't think so, you know. But I'm not dopey. <laughs> or sleepy, you know. Maybe sometimes. But the point being, when you meet me, you recognize my personality. You recognize my character. When you see me in some lights of different circumstances, then you recognize the character I have as opposed to the character I am. See, the character I am can be a caricature of the life that I've been living. It could be a type or kind of like a, a humorous way of looking at some of the things that I've gone through. But when you have character, that means there's something about the way you do things in life, the personality that you have that is dominated by a certain underlying foundation that comes obviously out in your experiences and the way that you do things, the way that you handle things, the way that you are. And having character is one of those things that development as a Christian is what we are learning to be less of a character but to have character. Meaning that we become likened unto the character we call Jesus. Now, he's not a character, he's the Son of God. But his human life that he lived in this world, we are told how to live according to the measure of what he set as a standard for us. It's not a measure that we can say we're going to attain to. It's a measure that we say we're going to live accordingly after the manner that he did, the character that he had. Because whenever people met Jesus by his lifestyle, by his words and by his actions, he was obviously a man of character. He stood out in the crowd, and it wasn't because of what he looked like. You see, Josephus and many other writers, you know, have told us that it wasn't much to look at. You know, I mean, Jesus wasn't blonde haired, blue eyed, and wandered around with a halo. You know, I mean, it's a nice idea, but it just wasn't true. But he had character, and that seemed to shine. You know, and you've seen people like that. When someone has character, they're like, you know, the guy you can trust. You know, kind of like, you know, when we say in the posse, you know, he's got your back, you know, he's got you covered, you know, hey, gotcha, you know, and you're, you're, you're a member of that group, you know, and that group has character. Now, it may be more of a character than have character, but within its own little kind of like, you know, click, you know, it has character. It has little things that make it unique and distinctive about itself. And that's what we mean by having character. It has a item or a personality that separates itself from something else, from the normal way of looking at things. So it's not just one of many, but it seems to have a, a separation, a difference between the two. And we can see that in characters as opposed to just kind of mass appeal. When we look at a crowd, do you ever see someone stand out in a crowd? That's what we mean by character. Sometimes in the way when we talk about being born again, we use these spiritual terms to 
talk about things that we can use in uh, worldly terms the same way. Character is one of them. Character in spiritual terms would be defined as you're a light. You're a light shining in the darkness. You stand out. You have a certain uniqueness. You have a certain distinctive. Your personality comes through as light. Now, you may be a flashlight, <laughs> and you may be a candle, or you may be, you know, kind of like a black light, you know, or something, but quite frankly, you know, whether you know it or not, your actions, your words, your deeds, your thoughts, your processes of way of dealing with things, because you're born again, comes out. It stands out. You are a character study. You are a person to look at and to see something about that we can learn from and discover or uncover whether or not you be of the faith or in the faith. You see, of the faith is simply saying, yeah, you know, I believe that, you know, God is real, you know, and that, yeah, you know, I kind of I kind of read my Bible and I go to church, you know, and it's, it's a good thing, and that's being of the faith. You know, you're of that faith in Jesus, in God, in the Bible, you know, in religion, you know, in church, and, you know, you're of the faith. But to be in the faith, you have to actually do something with that of faith to be in faith. And that's what we mean by born again. You become born again, not of the flesh, which is of faith, but you become born again of the spirit, which is in faith. So one is of and one is in. So where are you? <laughs> are you a character of the flesh or are you a having character in you? being developed into the character that Jesus is, or having the same character that Jesus exemplifies, which is of his Father. One of the natures that we talk about of character is love, peace, joy. One of the failings I have as a character, because I am a character, is that I hate stupid. <laughs> and that makes me a character. <laughs> I I hate stupid. You know, when I see something stupid, I call it stupid. You know, I mean, I just think that's stupid. You know, that's like, well, duh. You know, I mean, don't you think that way sometimes? You see something, you go, well, that's dumb. <laughs> I mean, you know, ah. but you see, as a Christian, I shouldn't be looking at it and thinking just that it's dumb. But what can I do to help dumbness become smartness? <laughs> and sometimes I don't want to. <laughs> I think, hey, they're dumb. Watch it become dumber. <laughs> Watch Dumb and Dumber fall in the pit. <laughs> but that's not having character. That's being a character. That's a character flaw. And one of the things that I've been rejoicing in today, to put it bluntly, is that I've been less of a character and more having character lately. And I'm enjoying that because having character makes you able to enjoy life more than to employ kind of like I'm avoiding them you know, or trying to, you know, be kind of like weirdo or wacko or kind of like, you know, like, you know, telling everybody what to do and how to do it. Rather, when you have character, you don't have to be involved in everything all around you. You can enjoy what God is telling you to do if you have character, when we say being a light, because you're more using that with which is within you, which is having character, than it is becoming a character. And that's kind of what we do in utmost, is that we don't want to be a character too much. Because we all are unique and distinctive, and God has created us with personality and with individuality. And he wants us to be unique and distinctive from everyone else. But he also wants us to have a unity of faith and be unified in the faith. He wants us to be one in the spirit and one in the Lord. So there's a perspective of there being neither male nor female and yet at the same time you know I hope there is a difference between male and female no matter whether you're in the faith or not <laughs> such a deal so there is a difference and there's a unity one is of and one is in helpful or heartless toward others it is Jesus who also makes intercession for us the spirit makes intercession for the saints. Romans 8.34 and Romans 8.27 Do we need any more arguments than these to become intercessors? Then Jesus always lives to make intercession? Hebrews 7.25 And that the Holy Spirit makes intercession for the saints. Are we living
living in such a relationship with others that we do the work of intercession as a result of being the children of God who are taught by his spirit. Intercession or interceding would be asking on their behalf. That simple. You're not acting as a matrix or dominant intermatrix. I forget what they call it. but You're not acting as someone who goes between two people. You're acting on behalf of that person. You're saying, hey, you know, I saw so-and-so, you know, and they were without shoes. So you go to the store and you buy some shoes and you say, you know, look, I'm going to get some shoes for this person, you know, and I want you to help me get them. And you go get some people to help and you get the shoes and you give it to the person. That's interceding on their behalf. They have a need. You're helping to meet the need. Likewise, intercession can be as simple as something like, hey, you know, you see someone trying to cross the street. I always use the little old lady idea because everybody's seen a little old lady trying to cross the street. Okay, maybe a little old man. But the point is, you see someone crossing the street, and nowadays, if you try to help them, believe me, you'll get arrested. <laughs> There's character again, or instead of having character. Because if you have character, they trust you. If you don't have character, then you're going to get arrested. <laughs> but when you see someone in need, you help them. That's what the Good Samaritan was. He had character. And that's what intercession is the same as. It's interceding on behalf. It's doing something for someone that they can't do for themselves or they won't do for themselves or they haven't done for themselves yet. That's what intercession is. And it usually means interceding in prayer, asking God to do it for you because you can't. And you're doing it for someone else, not yourself. Or you could intercede for yourself in some ways. <laughs> kind of weird idea, but yeah, it works that way too. We should take a look at our current circumstances. Do crises which affect us or others in our home, business, and country or elsewhere seem to be crushing in on us? Are things happening to us? Are we being pushed out of the presence of God and left with no time for worship? If so, we must put a stop to such distractions and get into such a living relationship with God that our relationship with others is maintained through the work of intercession where God works his miracles. In utmost, the desire is to always be the highest that we can attain to for the utmost that we could possibly do. So, a lot of idealism is practicalism in the sense of what you can do in order to be at that level that God would have you to be the same way that Jesus was. And so what they're talking about now is simply the idea that if you are worshipped up, fed up, read up, you know, and all this stuff, we used to call it that. You know, you read up in the morning, you get your devotional time in, you get your prayer time in, you get all this other stuff time in, you know, so that way all through the day, whatever you see, you can pray. You can say, hey, you know, I just saw that guy walking down the street, you know, he's limping. Lord, heal him, you know, just bless him and heal him, you know, or or you run into something, you know, like on the internet. Somebody says something stupid to you, you know, and you just go, slam them, jam them, cram them. <laughs> See, I told you I was a character. No, I, I'm trying not to do that, you know. I, people misunderstand what I'm trying to do. And so lately I've been not doing that, or I've been doing that, but in a different way that's really not cramming, slamming, and, you know, whatever. It's really encouraging, you know. And that's what we're meant to do by intercession. You're supposed to see opportunities to act on their behalf for their benefit. And that's what intercession is. Praying for other people. Helping them in whatever it may be they don't know you're helping them with. Most people don't realize that Christian on the scene is God behind the scenes. Working to accomplish his will. Remember that. A Christian on the scene is God working behind the scenes to accomplish his will. So, when you're in life... Wherever you are, you are like salt, but you're not meant to be telling people you're salt or acting like salt. Your nature or your character is salt. It will automatically be accomplished around you because the Christian on the scene is God working behind the scenes. You're called to intercede. You're not called to whip out, you know, your your gun, you know, and shoot someone. No, you're told to whip out your sword, which is the spirit of God in the word of God, you know, the Bible. You know, and to pray accordingly and having done all to stand, not to open your mouth and, you know, blow them out of the water. We're not shotgun Christianity here. You know, I mean, I'm sorry, but, you know, the idea of blowing people away 
is a nice idea when it comes to Satan and his way or the world and its ways, you know, and the flesh, you know, kind of like, yeah, it's fun to do. I know, been there, done that. That made me a character, but not having character. Having character, you don't need a gun. You don't need a sword. You need to pray and you need to talk to God that way. And once you do, then you look at everyone and every moment of time as opportunity to be interrelated with God personally in your relationship, which is done through worship and truth and, you know, spirit and truth, you know, and walking with God and read, read up, fed up, prayed up, prayed up and all that stuff. And then relationship with each other, which is having no frustrations and consternations or aggravations between each other, but able to love one another. And sometimes without having to say it or do it or see it or be it. One of the things that I'm doing, and I've done in every church I go to, I intercede for the pastor period. Wherever I am, you know, I, I know I have a big nose and my face glows sort of, you know, kind of maybe. I just smile a lot and maybe that they think that's a glow. Yeah, because I'm really a character. I'm not much of having character. But in this, whenever I'm in a service, I grin. You know, if it's, if it's the Lord, you know, speaking, I'm just grinning, you know, like smiling. But I'm also, I know by my spirit inside, I'm encouraging that pastor because he's standing up there looking at a bunch of crowd out there and there's one face in the crowd that's smiling. Hello. <laughs> Everybody else is frowning. Ah, pastor's on it again. There he goes. You know, or they're like not looking at him or whatever. Me, I'm looking right at you know. Somebody talks to me, I'm making eye contact with them. You know, sorry, it's the way I was trained. But in so doing, I know that I'm the Johnny on the spot, as we used to say. I'm the Christian there the Christian on the scene that God is working behind the scenes to encourage the person who's up front in front of all the people while he is sharing what God has inspired him to to speak to say or even speaking himself God doing through him as we in the pulpit or pulpit in the uh, pews and sitting back and watching and paying attention hopefully are receiving from it and so that's what you are wherever you are, whether you're in church doing it for a pastor, or whether you're in your job, you know, being the character or having character that people know they can count on you because you're always there on time. You know, it's having character of on time. It's having character to do the job that God put you there for to do, which isn't to witness, it's to be a witness. See the difference? One, you think you got to do something. The other is you are something. You're living out the life of a Christian. You're not trying to do the Christian thing. And that's where a lot of Christians make the mistake. They're still in the flesh. They're trying to flesh out what the Spirit is trying to work out from inside out so that they become from the inside out accomplishing that which they think they can do from the outside in. And that's what the difference between works and grace really is. Once you have that relationship with God that is foundational, that you you have laid a good foundation that's based on grace and love, you know, grace and mercy, and love is the accomplishment of that grace and mercy that you've been given, then you're in love with the person and you don't have to feel like you need to beat them up, stomp on them, romp on them, chomp on them, or beat them, you know, to death with your, you know, new knowledge you've just discovered. Rather, you can just sit back and just smile at them because you're praying to hellfire and brimstone on them. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Give them a cup of cold water. Read Proverbs. You'll figure that one out. <laughs> but that's the reality of what we should be and we could be. When we become less of a character and we become more having character than what we actually are with our personality and our individual character flaws. Beware of getting ahead of God by your very desire to do His will. We run ahead of him in a thousand and one activities, becoming so burdened with people and problems that we don't worship God and we fail to intercede. We don't talk to God about each and every circumstance and situation. We think because we committed it unto him, we can run off and do our own thing. Well, you know, I committed it to him, now I'm doing it. <laughs> Everybody knows he's doing it, doing it, making a mess and chewing it, chewing it. Because when you make a mess, you got to chew on it. You know, I mean, you, you, you're really going to feed yourself your own bad food and bad experiences and, you know, doing things the hard way. But 
when you seek to do God's will, then you seek to do it his way and you follow through with the steps he says to do, which is to, in all your ways, acknowledge him, in every way, all through the day and all through the night, dwell in his promises, walk in his life. But the point is, in every way, seek to listen, hear, worship, understand, comprehend what God wants you to do. Then, according to that moment, do what in the now God says to do. And then as soon as you're in the now on something else, do it now. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. The word today is now. Right now. Not, not, not next second, not the next second after that, but now. Because see, God operates in the now. And that's where we are. We're today. We, we operate right now. We didn't operate in the past, and we're not going to operate in the future because we don't know the future. But Jesus said, don't think about the morrow, for the morrow shall take care of itself. Sufficient is the day and the evil thereof. And it's a Jewish expression that simply means, look, you got to live where you're at. You can't live where you're not, so you got to live where you are. Because wherever you go, there you are, as, you know, Buckaroo Banzai said in the you know, journey to the whatever zone. <laughs> but it's true. It's an old expression from, you know, some other things. But it just simply means now is now, so you got to do it now whatever it is. You can't postpone it. You can't plan it out for the future. You can't do anything. Jesus says sufficient is today and the evil thereof and sufficient is today. You can't add one hair to your head so what are you worried about? You know, Do today what you can do and don't do tomorrow what you can't do. Because guess what? You may not have tomorrow. And you sure don't have yesterday. <laughs> no matter what they say about time. The fact is our time is now. Now is the day of salvation. Today if you hear his voice harden not your heart act according to what you see, hear, touch, and feel now, and you will do as God says to do. If a burden and its resulting pressure come upon us while we are not in an attitude of worship, it will only produce a hardness toward God and despair in our souls. We get to the place where we think, oh man, you know God, I've been praying about that asking and doing and saying and you haven't done a thing. You know, you just have, you know, the old Bill Cosby routine. I don't know if you ever heard the album from Bill Cosby, Noah and the Flood, but he brought out a good point. You know, Noah finally gets ticked off after, you know, what, 300 years of building this ark. Yeah, you know, you said you're going to build an ark and there, you know, nothing's happening and I've been out there and I've been making it and, you know, I put all those, those animals in the ark and, you know, have you ever been down the bottom of that ark? Who's going to clean that ark? Not nah, me, I'm not cleaning that ark, you know. <laughs> well, he makes a funny humorous point, but then it starts raining and Noah goes, but, you know, but, okay, Lord, I knew it all along, right? You and me, yeah, we have it. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> you know, and, and the reality is we get carried away and we get despairing when we don't wait, when we don't trust, when we don't live in the moment. But we think that counting the past, it's been so long for our present that we say, oh, but it's not going to happen yet. It's not happening. It's not happening. Why, 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 why? No. Relax. Chill out. Right now it's not happening, but that doesn't mean it won't happen. <laughs> if God said it, he'll do it. Just be in the now now. Because <laughs> you won't worry about tomorrow's now, because tomorrow will be now. Now. How now, brown cow, so to speak. So God continually introduces us to people in whom we have no interest, and unless we are worshiping God, the natural tendency is to be heartless toward them. After all, they don't have the same interest we do. We give them a quick verse of scripture, like jabbing them with a spear, or leave them with a hurried, uncaring word of counsel before we go. God bless you, be peace, goodbye. You know, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Okay, bye. You know, kind of like you know the platitudes we offer in religious circles, when often we should have stopped long enough to care, be there, and listen to what the person is saying, and see where they're coming from, and know that there's more to what they're deal dealing with than what they just said. That's the attitude of intercession when we care enough to be in proper worship and relationship with God that we see them or every person as he sees them. A heartless Christian must be a terrible grief to our Lord. Are our lives in proper place so that we may participate in the intercession of our Lord and the work of the Holy Spirit, not just in our lives, but as our lives are his workmanship? created for good works in Jesus to accomplish his will and not our own. Often, life has no purpose unless you find the direction from God. It seems like you know what you're doing when you lay out a plan and you think you're accomplishing what you wanted in life and you 
have that foundation and you built this structure called your house and your car and your job and you know you got the kids and you got the wife and you got all these things that you were told to get and then one day your company says cutting back sorry you're gone they maybe give you a severance package or they just sever you <laughs> and you go but I did everything right yeah you did but it was wrong because it wasn't what you did that was important but it's where you put your faith in and your faith of if you put your faith in the eternality of things the things that are going to last forever then you're seeking first the kingdom of God and those things are going to last forever if you're putting your things in the things that are temporary or temporal then they're going to pass away your job's going to go away one way or another you know and me I've had lots of jobs <laughs> I've done several career changes <laughs> a lot <laughs> there are reasons why because of my my uh, incurable disease that I had you know have had whatever you know because with my health it's like you know one minute there one minute not who knows I'm a character but the reality of our character as it comes into conflict with the character capability that God wants us to have means that he's trying to create character in us so that we're no longer a character that we are and we become a character of what Jesus is like so that we have character rather than become a character and you could be really Superman if you want to and you could be you know Gunga Din if you want to and you could be like you know Warcraft or whatever you play on the internet with your avatar type of theology and you know your way of trying to personify yourself through your texting or your you know games people play or the persona that you portray at work you know your business professionalism or the person that you say you are at church rather than the person you are and that's being a character because you're putting on a character like a play and you're being what the Bible calls a hypocrite but when you have character you can't hide what God has done and you can't hide what God is and you can't help but be what God wants you to be because God is in you. That's being and having character.